cutting sickness first reared its ugly head in England in summer 1485, and there were four further outbreaks in 1508, 1517, 1528 and 1551, before it completely disappeared in England, never to be seen in the country again. It seems to have been a highly contagious disease, which decimated towns around England, sometimes taking thousands of lives. According to John Caius, the English physician, writing in 1552, towns thought themselves lucky if half the population survived. Although studies have since suggested that it was nowhere near as lethal as the plague, sweating sickness caused shock and horror because it was a brand new disease and it killed quickly. It was referred to by many different names, including the sweat, the Sudor Anglicus or English sweat, the swat, stuck gallant, stoop knave and know thy master, sweating sickness and the new acquaintance. Although some experts believe that it was carried to England by French mercenaries in Henry Tudor's army in August 1485, the civic records of York record a disease with the same symptoms as sweating sickness affecting the city in June 1485, two months before Henry's army landed in Milford Haven, Wales. There are also no records of the disease affecting Henry's army or the Welsh population that it had contact with during its march through Wales to Bosworth. It is recorded as reaching London on the 19th of September 1485. The people of England were already well acquainted with diseases like the plague, malaria, dysentery and typhoid fever, but sweating sickness was something new. It was also distinguishable from the influenza epidemic which affected Europe in 1510. Thomas Forestier, a French physician living in London, wrote a treatise on the disease and in it he described its main symptoms. These included a great sweating and stinking, redness of the face and body, a continual thirst, fever, headache and breathlessness. John Caius added, pain in the back, shoulder and extremities accompanied by flushing or redness, grief in the liver and stomach, i.e. abdominal pain, headache and madness, passion of the heart or cardiac palpitations, and a marvellous heaviness and a desire to sleep. Chronicler John Harding recorded people throwing off their bedclothes and running through the streets of London seeking relief from the fever. What was so shocking about sweating sickness was the speed it could kill people. Forestier recorded people dropping dead while walking down the street or while playing with their children. We saw two priests standing together and speaking together and saw both of them die suddenly. Also, in D.A. Proxima, we see the wife of a tailor and suddenly died. Another young man walking by the street fell down suddenly. Also, another gentleman riding out of the city died. Also, many others, the which were to rehearse we have known that have died suddenly. But that immediately killed some in opening their windows, some in playing with their children in their street doors, some in one hour, many in two it destroyed, and at the longest, to thee that merrily dined, it gave a sorrowful supper. As it found them, so it took them, some in sleep, some in wake, some in mirth, some in care, some fasting and some full, some busy and some idle. Chronicler Edward Hall wrote of it killing some people within two to three hours. This malady was so cruel that it killed some within three hours some within two hours, some merry at dinner and dead at supper. During the 1517 epidemic, the Venetian ambassador recorded the disease being fatal in 24 hours at the furthest, but many people being carried off in four or five hours. It appears that if people survived the first 24 hours, then they would make a full recovery. While diseases like the plague preyed on the poor, Records show that sweating sickness mainly affected the upper classes, particularly rich young men. Young children and the elderly tended to be spared. It hit mainly rural areas, but London and the student communities of Oxford and Cambridge and the monastic communities were badly affected. Its name, the English Sweat, came from the fact that it initially only affected England 
and the English population of Calais. It did not spread into Ireland, Scotland or Wales, and when foreigners residing in England were affected, they got it mildly and recovered. All five epidemics hit England in the summer or early autumn, with the peak usually being in August and then the disease dying out in September. There is controversy over where and when the first epidemic of sweating sickness started, but a citizen of London reported that it had hit the capital by the 27th of September 1485 and that it went on to kill Thomas Hill, the Lord Mayor, and then his replacement, Sir William Stoker, as well as a number of old men and many worshipful commoners. According to the Croyland Chronicle, Lambert Fosdyke, Abbot of Croyland, died of the disease on the 14th of October. Thomas Forestier recorded that 15,000 people died in London alone, but it has been pointed out that this must be an exaggeration because that would be a third of the city's population at that time. The next recorded outbreak of sweating sickness was 23 years later, in 1508, although some suggest that it may have caused the death of Prince Arthur in 1502, and there was also an outbreak of an unknown disease in Chester in 1507, which killed 91 people in three days, only four of whom were women. Thomas More wrote to Cardinal Wolsey in 1508 to draw his attention to the severe depredations of the sweating sickness among the young gentlemen of Oxford and Cambridge, and there are records of the disease killing members of the household of the Lord Treasurer in the July, public prayers being said at St Paul's in August, and the King's servants being struck down by the disease. The Lord Chamberlain and Lord Privy Seal both survived it, but the young Lord Greystoke and Dr Simeon, Dean of the Chapel Royal, died. Chronicler Edward Hall recorded the third outbreak of sweating sickness in 1517. He said, Suddenly there came a plague of sickness called the sweating sickness that turned all his purpose. This malady was so cruel that it killed some within three hours, some within two hours, some merry at dinner and dead at supper. Many died in the King's court, the Lord Clinton, the Lord Grey of Wilton, and many knights, gentlemen and officers. For this plague, Michaelmas term was adjourned. The Venetian ambassador wrote on the 6th of August 1517 that many of the king's household are sick and Ammonio, his Latin secretary, died. Few strangers are dead, but an immense number of natives. The Venetian ambassador and his son both came down with it, but pulled through. Cardinal Wolsey also suffered from an attack and subsequent relapses but he was able to fight off the illness. Fifteen of his household weren't so lucky. It was also reported that members of the royal court, including the Queen's steward, Mr Morgan, and Matthew Jones of the King's wardrobe, perished. It was also reported that 400 students died at Oxford, although it's not clear whether this was from the plague or from sweating sickness. The next outbreak of sweating sickness was in 1528, this time, the disease spread across the English Channel, but it only affected the English outpost of Calais, where it only seems to have affected Englishmen. It affected the English court in London in May 1528, causing the court to be broken up and the king and queen to flee. This epidemic hit the English clergy hard. There was an outbreak at a convent in Wilton in July 1528, an outbreak in Lincolnshire which killed four priests and two lay brethren, and an outbreak at the Charter House in London, which caused many deaths. Cardinal Wolsey's household was affected by the disease, although the Cardinal escaped infection. And we know from the reports of the French ambassador, Du Bellay, that by the 18th of June, some 2,000 people in London alone were afflicted, and that this had risen to 40,000 by the 30th of June, although only 2,000 died. Du Bellay also wrote that 18 of the Archbishop of Canterbury's domestic staff died of the disease. In the July, the Bishop of London reported that 13 of his servants had gone down with the sickness on the same day. Henry VIII managed to avoid the disease, and his sweetheart Anne Boleyn survived it. But William Compton, Francis Points and William Carey, all members of the King's Privy Chamber, died, and other prominent members of the court including the Marquis and Marchioness of Dorset, Sir Thomas Cheney, Henry Norris, Sir John Wallop, George Boleyn and Thomas Boleyn also came down with the illness, but survived. 
On the 30th of June, Dubelay recorded that all but one of the King's Privy Chamber had come down with the disease. The Marchioness of Exeter was then recorded as being taken ill on the 9th of July. Some records suggest that this epidemic also moved to Hamburg via an English ship, where it killed 1,000 people in less than 24 hours. It then spread along the Baltic, into Scandinavia, and south further into Germany and Austria. One expert points out that in Vienna, which was under siege by the Turks at the time, it only affected the local people. The Turks were spared. 23 years later, in 1551, the disease struck again. This is the epidemic that the famous English physician John Caius recorded in his 1552, a book or counsel against the disease commonly called the sweat or sweating sickness. It was also the epidemic that took the lives of the Duchess of Suffolk's sons, Henry and Charles. Caius writes of how the disease began in the middle of April in Shrewsbury and that it spread to Ludlow and the Welsh Marches, Coventry, Oxford and then to the south and southwest. It affected London from the July and then moved to eastern England and the north where it began to diminish until the end of September when it finally died out. In Loughborough it killed 19 people in six days and in Oxford it attacked 60 in just one night. Between the 9th and 16th of July, Caius recorded 761 deaths and by the 30th of July, 142 more had died. Prominent court members who died included Sir Thomas Speke of the King's Council and Sir John Wallop, who'd fought it off successfully in 1528. Caius wrote of how people tried to escape the disease by fleeing to Ireland, Scotland and France, but that it followed English people like a shadow. While it spared the natives of those countries, it still affected the English people who'd fled there. It was never heard of again in England after the 1551 epidemic, but a similar disease was reported in Leipzig in 1652. Various parts of France in 1818, 1821 and 1845, northern Spain in 1835, northern Italy in 1849 and Holland in 1850. In August 1517, the papal nuncio reported on the sweating sickness epidemic and included the advice given to treat it. The sweat lasted 24 hours, more or less. During the fit, it was fatal to take any cold beverage or to allow any air to penetrate the garments or bedclothes in which the patient commenced perspiring. It was necessary to have rather more covering than usual, though even in this, great caution was needed as some had been suffocated by more than requisite amount of covering. The bedchamber should have a moderate fire so as not to heat the room, but to keep it at a tepid temperature. The arms should be crossed on the patient's breast, and great care be taken lest the least air reach the armpits. To neglect these precautions ensured immediate death. The Great Chronicle of London recorded that much people died suddenly for lack of good guidance, for they were kept too hot and close that many were smouldered. They might have been saved with moderate keeping. Chronicler John Harding wrote of physicians advising people to lie down in their clothes and bedclothes, to stay in bed for 24 hours, to avoid eating meat and to drink as little as possible. Polydore Virgil wrote of how survivors of the disease shared how they'd beaten it and that the advice included retiring immediately to bed at the first sign of illness, lying quietly and not moving for exactly 24 hours, adding clothing slowly so that the sweating would come gently and naturally, avoiding eating for as long as possible, drinking lukewarm fluid and keeping the entire body covered. Many of the contemporary sources report the disease only affecting English people and foreigners being immune to it or catching it mildly. This obviously isn't completely true because the disease did spread onto the continent in the late 1520s and a similar disease was recorded in the 19th century in Europe. However, in 1881, Dr Arthur Boudier presented a paper to the Anthropology Society of Paris in which he argued that the disease did not affect just English people but that it affected the fair-haired races of Northern Europe, i.e. 
those who descended from the Anglo-Saxons, and that it was those who descended from the Celts who were spared. It's an interesting theory. Nobody knows for sure what the sweating sickness was and what actually caused it. Theories regarding its identity and cause include arthropod-borne virus, commonly known as arbovirus. The fact that it was a summer disease which affected many rural communities could suggest that it was an arthropod-borne virus with a rodent host. A viral pulmonary disease, such as hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, HPS. This syndrome is caused by catching a virus from infected small rodents and it has the following symptoms in succession. Fever, myalgia, headache, rapidly progressive non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. 88% of patients require mechanical ventilation within 24 hours of admission to hospital and death within 72 hours. Bad air, dirty houses and a rich diet. John Caius concluded that the disease was caused by close and unstirred air, impure spirits in bodies corrupt by repletion, too much meat in the diet or eating infected fruits. Erasmus, in a letter to Francis, physician to the Cardinal of York, wrote of how English houses were not constructed to make a through-draft possible, and that their rush floors were unhygienic because sometimes they were not renewed for around 20 years, and so they allowed spittle, vomit, dog's urine, and men's too, dregs of beer and cast-off bits of fish, and other unspeakable kinds of filth, to fester. Others blamed the damp, foggy English climate, but these factors are unlikely to have caused such an epidemic. Relapsing fever. In the past, some have suggested that sweating sickness was actually relapsing fever, which is a disease spread by lice or ticks. Its symptoms include fever, chills, headache, joint and muscle ache, and nausea. Influenza. Some believe it to have been a form of influenza, but influenza was known in the 15th and 16th centuries, and yet sweating sickness was written about as a new and shocking disease. None of the theories seem to really fit the symptoms and spread of sweating sickness in the 16th century, and perhaps this chewed killer will always be a mystery. In an article, The Sweating Sickness Returns, in Discover magazine, Gant and Thwaites point out that they could possibly test out their hypothesis, which is Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, by exhuming the body of Henry Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, who died from sweating sickness in 1551 but they have no plans to disturb his grave because the odds of survival of this type of genetic material is very low. I guess we'll just never know. <laughs>